you will be relieved to see that I do have a text. Uh, otherwise, just ramble on and on and on. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for that overly generous uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be back here uh, at Lafayette again, and especially pleased to be here in your good hands. I'm sure Lafayette knows how fortunate it is to have Dan as its president. President Weiss has suggested that it would be helpful, might be helpful, if I were first to sketch some of the environmental trends affecting liberal arts colleges and then discuss their implications for these colleges. In seeking to discharge this assignment, I am cognizant of the extent to which how one was educated and spent formative years affects one's fix on life. I have been extraordinarily fortunate to have lived most of my days on inviting college and university campuses in the company of inspiring teachers, wonderful colleagues, and friends. These are then the thoughts of a happy camper, <laughs> not those of a disgruntled student, angry faculty member, or disenchanted alumnus. I am also an optimist, as you may infer from the title of this talk, More to Hope Than to Fear, which is an inversion of Keynes' famous admonition on how people ought to feel about bond prospects when interest rates are low. <laughs> <clears throat> and I should say that in this paper, which I will hand over to Dan after we're done, uh, I have many, many footnotes so that uh, assertions, references are, are there, but I will, of course, not burden you with them tonight, uh, with one exception in just a moment. Environmental trends. Here is my list. First is an indisputable fact, the ever-increasing importance of brain in today's world. This is reflected in greater and greater rewards to the well-educated individual, whether measured in lifetime earnings, in the odds of having a satisfying family life, in good health, in lifelong enjoyment of the arts and the pleasures of the mind, or in opportunities for service. The ever-increasing power of trained intelligence, by no means limited to this country, has consequences for entire societies. And now the one note that I will read you. The note is from a talk, a wonderful talk, given by Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel Prize winning economist born in St. Lucia, at his installation as Chancellor of the fledgling University of Guyana in January 1967. Arthur described the evolution of thinking about the processes of economic growth in these words, quote, poverty is not primarily due to people not working hard enough or to inadequate land or even to inadequate capital. It is primarily due to inadequate knowledge and primitive techniques which keep output per head low. He then noted the tribute that men pay to brain. Let me put this into historical perspective, he said. Not very long ago, men lived in caves or under the shadow of trees. Their lives were dominated by fear, fear of the elements, of drought and flood and fire, fear of other animals, and fear of other men who wandered around in families or tribes ready to exterminate each other. The human race has pulled itself up from this by handing down from generation to generation knowledge of two sets of principles, those relating to controlling nature, which we call science, and principles relating to controlling human behavior, which we call ethics. Human life as we know it today is based on accumulated science and accumulated ethical principles enshrined in laws and in the conventions of decent behavior end of quotation. Now my second proposition trend is a disquieting fact. 
Since about 1970, educational attainment in the U.S. has been on a plateau. And this stagnation has occurred at the same time that other countries have been making great strides in education, educating higher fractions of their populations. There is understandable concern about how this fall off in our placement in the league tables will affect this country's competitiveness in years to come. Third, worries about international competitiveness are magnified by the globalization of activities of all kinds. References to a flat world shaped by the speed of communication and the ready flow of resources of all kinds across national boundaries are by no means all hype. Fourth, there is in this country a wide gap in educational outcomes seen in relation to socioeconomic states. Put simply, the odds that a young person will graduate from college are dramatically higher if the individual comes from a privileged family. Factoring in both high school and college graduation rates, Nell's data show that for the putative high school class of 1992, the odds of earning a BA were over seven times, seven times higher for students from high SES backgrounds, top income quartile, having at least one parent who graduated from college, than for those from, less, from lower SES backgrounds. It would not be surprising if this same pattern were to be found in other countries, but I don't know if this is the case. Fifth, <clears throat> the U.S. has been experiencing a dramatic increase in inequality of income. The by now famous discussion of the 99% to 1% divide is a vivid illustration of the degree to which this phenomenon has gained traction and caused resentment. Witness the Occupy Wall Street movement. Again, this does not appear to be only a U.S. phenomenon. Sixth, we know that this country is also experiencing major demographic trends. The days of a dominant white majority are rapidly ending. By 2042, according to projections by the U.S. Census Bureau, the white population will be a minority. Seventh, there is a growing political polarization in the U.S. One result is that middle-of-the-road thinking is out of favor. There is a poisoning of political discourse that discourages compromises aimed at problem-solving. Eighth, and closer to home, there are growing economic pressures on much of higher education, and especially on the public sector. This is the result of deep-seated fiscal problems at both federal and state levels, marked by an aversion to higher taxes and pressures for more spending on items such as health care, coupled with calls for austerity. Ninth, there is a concurrent growth in concern about the affordability of higher education. One consequence is that there is great reluctance by universities <laughs> especially but not only public universities, <clears throat> to use large tuition increases as an escape valve when faced with funding cutbacks. A related phenomenon is more and more emphasis on short-run vocational objectives and sharp increases in professional and pre-professional programs that are expected by students and parents to yield near-term economic payoffs. Tenth and last on my list, of trends, the digital age and rapid technological change are evident everywhere. There is escalating growth in internet usage, social networking, online learning, and none of that is going to change. Now I turn to implications for liberal arts colleges of these trends. To my mind, the implications for liberal arts colleges fall <clears throat> into two overlapping categories implications for economic viability and for programmatic and budgeting policies, including those affecting tuition and financial aid. And then secondly, implications for how our colleges teach and what sort of educational outcomes they should seek to achieve. My major injunction under the heading of programmatic budgeting policies is simple. 
stay the course. You are playing a winning hand. The value of a liberal education as traditionally understood has never been as great as it is today. Nan Cohane has provided a comprehensive account of the reasons why this is so, and I will not repeat the arguments she makes so eloquently. I will add only a point of emphasis. As we think about the rapidly changing world our students face, in which fewer and fewer people spend anything approaching a lifetime following one career trajectory, learning how to do mundane, repetitive tasks is not the way to go. What counts is both the acquisition of broad gauge problem solving skills and knowing how to function effectively in collaborative settings involving all kinds of people. Being able to take a new problem, parse it out, and make headway in solving it, all in the company of others, are crucial skills. Such skills can be honed in excellent liberal arts colleges as well as great universities. The president of Yale, Richard Levin, has pointed out the irony that at the same time that liberal education is under assault by some here at home, it is being extolled and adopted really for the first time in other parts of the world, such as Asia. Budgetary choices are always hard, especially when constraints are tight. In choosing how to spend limited resources, it is important not to demean classic offerings that have stood the test of time. Spending money on personalized education and on a high quality residential experience is wise. Here is an obverse proposition. Colleges should resist spending money on what many will regard as frills. Overly elaborate student centers, expensive playing fields, to cite just two examples. Some thoughts as to where scarce dollars should and should not go. <clears throat> a high priority should be placed on spending both money and time recruiting exceptional faculty leaders in key disciplines. Even if this means bruising the sensibilities of some current faculty by recruiting from outside at senior levels, thereby saying, in effect, we need stronger leadership. Recruiting opportunities are more promising today than they have been in many years, given the fiscal and other problems facing the country, especially the public sector of higher education. <coughs> Next, many colleges are wisely investing in approaches designed to help their students gain a good sense of other cultures. This too makes excellent sense in the globalized world unfolding before us, especially if real educational values are emphasized and not just the pleasures of brief sojourns abroad. Next, spend money on helping your students understand basic science and its ramifications. But seek collaborations with universities as well as with colleges to avoid budget-breaking outlays on laboratories and equipment that should be shared. Experimenting with virtual laboratories is wise. Then, in the digital world of today and tomorrow, students need training in how to use technology and in how to learn online. But colleges should not invest in developing expensive online platforms of their own. Centralized help is needed more scale than colleges have. Next, outlays on financial aid are investments and should be treated that way, not merely as discounts used to win bidding wars. The cases for enrolling a diverse student body for allowing talented students of modest means to get an excellent liberal arts education are, if anything, more powerful than ever before, given the importance of preparing students to function effectively in a world in which most people don't look like them. At the same time, tempting as it may be to join the merit aid wars, I think that this tendency should be resisted, even if that means losing some excellent students. In defining excellent students, I would emphasize real accomplishments 
good grades and high scores on achievement tests, along with leadership potential and coping skills, I would not emphasize scores on aptitude tests, which our research has shown are poor predictors of almost everything except family wealth. <laughs> Finally, I remain steadfastly opposed to athletic scholarships, which I think are an embarrassment and an abomination, especially at a time when there are so many needy students. I am skeptical that it is wise to go as far as the wealthier institutions, such as Harvard and Princeton, have gone in replacing all loans with grants for families above a modest income threshold, perhaps with exceptions, as we were saying today, for students who pursue vocations that pay little. Many other students in the higher middle income range will earn substantial returns on their educational investments and there is no reason they should not repay some of the funds that were, in effect, advanced to them. Reasonable amounts of educational debt are not bad things, and sustained efforts should be made to spread the costs of higher education across a wide population of beneficiaries. Finally, in the face of much furor over allegedly high tuition charges and affordability, I would not overreact. I believe that strong colleges and universities that emphasize the right kinds of learning and the right values will continue to attract sufficient numbers of outstanding students, regardless of modest variations in the level of tuition. Many of these students will come from families that can pay and that should pay, even if that means horror of horrors sacrificing an occasional winter vacation in order to make a lifetime investment on behalf of their children. A quarter of a century ago, I wrote a pair of essays on tuition that stressed the risks of charging too little as well as too much. I stand by those essays today. It is by no means infradig to remind families that higher education is much more than a consumer good and that thanks to the generosity of those who attended in earlier years, many of the best colleges provide an implicit subsidy, often a large one, to every current student. Having said all of that, I recognize that all, underscore all, of higher education faces serious political risks from escalating tuition, even when higher tuition levels are justified and accompanied by generous financial aid. It is imperative, I think, that public universities, especially but not solely, intensify efforts to transform teaching methods to reduce instructional costs, and then pass on at least some of the savings to students and their families. I turn now to implications for teaching methods and desired educational outcomes. Implicit in what I have just said are clear implications for what I believe students attending good liberal arts colleges should learn. <coughs> Woody Flowers, a highly regarded teacher on the MIT faculty, not a liberal arts college, but not a bad place, <laughs> has encouraged us to distinguish, quote, education, quote, unquote, from training, quote, unquote. And there is much in what he says even as I think he fails to see how blurry the lines are between his two categories. Flowers suggests that, and I now quote him, codified knowledge is susceptible to training, whereas education is much more subtle and complex. Learning a CAD program is training, while learning to design requires education. Learning spelling and grammar is training, while learning to communicate requires education. In many cases, learning the parts is training, while understanding and being creative about the whole requires education." End of quote. Henry Adams has taught us that in thinking about education, all of us are autobiographical. In that spirit, I hope I may be allowed an example of what should be learned that is taken from my own educational history 
albeit at the graduate level. I took a beginning course in economic theory from William Baumel, a distinguished economist and one of my closest friends to this day, about to celebrate his 90th birthday. We used a text by J.R. Hicks, Value in Capital, that is one of the most densely packed and worst written books I have ever <laughs> encountered. I always suspected that Professor Baumel chose it in part for that reason. We covered, if my memory serves me, 35 pages in an entire semester. When we were studying a particularly inscrutable passage, Professor Bamo would say to the class, your assignment for next week is to take this passage and write me a three-page paper explaining in clear English what it means. I would go back to my room and struggle and struggle and struggle until I realized if I were fortunate and often in the middle of the night, I've got it. I remember vividly leaping out of bed and writing down the key insight before I lost it. The course also included excruciating sessions at the blackboard in which students attempted to explain concepts to their classmates under the relentless prodding of Professor Baum, who insisted that we speak as well as write in clear sentences. That at times searing educational experience from which not everyone survived <laughs> taught me several lessons that I have never forgotten. One is that clear thinking has to precede clear writing, but that the former does not guarantee the latter. A second lesson was that it might take me quite a while to understand something, longer than it took some of my classmates, but that if I persevered, I could figure most things out. Thanks to Professor Baumel's friendly but demanding tutelage, I gained a quiet confidence that was, is, a gift of incredible value. An impersonal educational setting, studying with a much less gifted teacher, would not have permitted that kind of learning. I am certainly not saying, however, that all teaching, even at liberal arts colleges, has to have this one-on-one -on -one character, though much of it should. There is also a place for sophisticated online learning that is largely machine-guided especially when used in courses in which there is more or less one answer to basic questions and when it is made part of a hybrid mode of instruction that includes face-to-face -face interactions between teacher and student. To be sure, systems that provide interactive learning online, ILO systems as Kevin Guthrie and I refer to them, have much less to offer liberal arts colleges than financially hard-pressed public universities that have to teach introductory courses in subjects such as statistics and pre-college math to large numbers of students. Still, students attending all kinds of institutions will benefit from learning how to learn in online environments. My plea is for the adoption of a quote-unquote portfolio approach to curricular development that provides a carefully calibrated mix of learning styles. This mix will vary by institutional type, and liberal arts colleges can and should put much more weight on seminars, discussion groups, directed study than large institutions can hope to do. Nonetheless, even the wealthiest, most elite colleges and universities that can afford to stay pretty much as they are should ask if failing to participate at least to some degree in the evolution of sophisticated online learning models is to their advantage in the long run or to the advantage of the country. Students at these places, along with others of their generation, will expect to use digital resources and to be trained in their care, in their use. In short, the choice is not one or the other. It's not either or. Portfolio thinking makes sense. 
More generally, there is everything to be said for heeding Derek Bach's admonition that a determined effort should be made to help faculty teach better, in part by being sure that they are aware of and take account of the insights of recent research in fields such as cognitive science. Liberal arts colleges in particular should put a real premium on doing all that can be done to ensure that excellent teaching actually occurs and is not reflected solely in the language of promotional materials, abstract pronouncements, and inspirational talks. Next, a few more words, if I may, about styles of teaching in the personalized setting, settings that are and should continue to be the hallmarks of liberal arts colleges. Another of my great teachers, Jacob Viner, echoed Jeremy Bentham in decrying nonsense on stilts, <laughs> which Professor Viner described as, quote, a type of sophisticated nonsense of ignorant learning which only the well-educated are capable of perpetuating. <laughs> Viner loved to tell this story. A woman in a shop asked for a drinking bowl for her dog. When the clerk replied that he had no drinking bowls, especially for dogs, the woman said that any drinking bowl would do. The clerk, having found one for her, suggested that he have the word dog painted on it. No thanks, said the woman, it's not necessary. My husband doesn't drink water from a bowl and my dog can't read. <laughs> Viner's conclusion, learning should be kept in its place. There is, of course, a critically important role for learning, assuming that it is kept in its place. In the best selective residential institutions, the right kind of learning occurs more or less constantly, as often or more often, out of the classroom as in it. This cliche, repeated by all presidents of strong residential colleges and universities, conveys real truth. Late night, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges offer students a hard to replicate access to the perspectives of other smart people. As Professor Viner never tired of warning his students, quote, there is no limit to the amount of nonsense you can think if you think too long alone. <clears throat> Grasping complexity, embracing it, is a critical capacity to be learned earlier rather than later in life. Liberal arts colleges should do all in their power to encourage students to avoid the polarized thinking that is sad to say, becoming the standard of our day. Einstein was right in asserting that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not more so. Dilemmas are real and should be acknowledged, not dismissed by sloganeering. Isaiah Berlin's famous book, Russian Thinkers, is full of examples of the dilemmas faced by 19th century Russian writers, as many of them sought to balance a yearning for absolutes with the complex visions that they simply could not push from their minds, and to do so in a terribly troubled time. Berlin writes with special empathy about Alexander Herzen and others, quote, who see and cannot help seeing many sides of a case. The middle ground, he wrote, is a notoriously exposed, dangerous, and ungrateful position. So it is. Nonetheless, students need to be both thoughtful enough and courageous enough to occupy it when that is where hard thought takes them. Mining this same vein of quotable quotes with enduring lessons, I will next tell you tales of two horses. Sorry about the tales. One cited in Maine and the other in Arabia. Each has a moral. When I referred earlier to the need to inculcate in students an appreciation for the way scientists think, I had in mind the need to develop a healthy skepticism that includes a deep-seated respect for evidence, an incorrigible need to find the facts. There is a wonderful little book 
called The Fastest Hound Dog in the State of Maine that illustrates this mindset. It is thoroughly Maine, the author suggests, to want the full facts before negotiating an opinion. He then provides this exchange between two people riding on a train in Maine. Is that a white horse? Seems to be from this side. <laughs> there is also great value in recognizing what one does not know and realizing when it is time to punt. A great friend of mine, Ezra Zilka, grew up in Baghdad and is fond of telling stories from the Arabian Nights, the Arabian horse now. This is the story of the black horse. A prisoner who was about to be executed was having his last audience with the Sultan. He implored the Sultan, if you will spare me for one year, I will teach your favorite black horse to talk. The Sultan agreed immediately with this request and the prisoner was returned to his quarters. When his fellow prisoners heard what had happened, they mocked him. How can you possibly teach a horse to talk? Absurd. <clears throat> he replied, wait a minute, think. A year is a long time. In a year, I could die naturally. The Sultan could die. The horse could die. <laughs> or, who knows, I might teach the black horse to talk. When telling the story, Mr. Zilka always described himself as an adaptive pessimist. The lesson of the story, he said, if you don't have an immediate answer, buy time. <laughs> time, if you use it, might make us adapt and maybe, who knows, find solutions. If speaking to a college or university audience, and Ezra himself was a graduate of, is a graduate of Wesleyan, he would add, it is the job of the college to learn to teach the black horse to talk. I end now with another admonition, easier to state than to follow. Do not be reluctant to accept the obligation of the college to teach students to think about values as well as about how to achieve more mundane ends. This is most definitely not a plea for indoctrination, nor is it a plea for pontification. I remember well the comment of Roger, Robert Hutchins when he was urged to teach his students at Chicago to do this, that, or the other thing. Quote, all attempts to teach character directly will fail. They degenerate into vague exhortations to be good, which leave the bored listener with a desire to commit outrages which would otherwise never have occurred to me. <laughs> Assuming, however, that we are wise enough to avoid such excesses, my admonition about the desirability of putting emphasis on values suggests a dimension along which the best liberal arts colleges can and should differentiate themselves from other <laughs> institutions that may be afraid even to allude to something as ineffable and even as dangerous as values. Again, I have a text. This time it is from a baccalaureate address given in 2010 by Jeff Bezos, the hugely successful CEO of Amazon who is apparently, Jeff is apparently, cut from a different cloth than other alleged exemplars of corporate leadership whom we have been reading about of late, though I cannot judge the accuracy of those often harsh portrayals. The, titles, the title Bezos gave to his talk was, quote, we are what we choose. He began by reciting a poignant story of a trip he took with his grandparents when he was 10 years old. While riding in their Airstream trailer, this precocious 10-year-old laboriously calculated the damage to her health that his grandmother was doing by smoking. His conclusion was that at two minutes per puff, she was taking nine years off her life. 
when he proudly told her of his finding, she burst into tears. His grandfather stopped the car and gently said to Jeff, one day you'll understand that it's harder to be kind than clever. Bezos went on to talk about the difference between gifts and choices. Cleverness, he said, is a gift. Kindness is a choice. Gifts are easy. They're given, after all. Choices can be hard. He then challenged the graduating students to think carefully about their future range of choices. He asked, will you be clever at the expense of others, or will you be kind? Now, there is, of course, an all too real limit to what colleges can do to shape the thinking of their students. But it is well to recognize that our colleges, at their best, can and should encourage their students to learn to choose wisely, to learn to be kind. Our colleges should do this at the same time that they seek to inculcate in their students an insatiable appetite to learn new things in new ways while always respecting evidence and to inculcate in them too a capacity to occupy when their best thinking takes them there, the notoriously exposed, dangerous, and ungrateful middle ground. These avowedly subjective goals will always elude the quantifiers among us and the quantifiers within us. Still, if they can be embraced, the future of liberal arts colleges will offer, without question, more to hope than to fear.